Hi, I'm Mike Fowler, CTO of Synologic, and I'm going to be talking to you about chaos engineering with the new AWS Fault Injection Simulator. So let's get started with some ideas of what chaos engineering even is and what we will be trying to do with the Fault Injection Simulator. So if we do a sort of lookup of what chaos is, you know, we get a, it's a noun and it's complete disorder and confusion. So we look at engineering and we take that it's the action of working artfully to bring something about. So by chaos engineering, then, do we perhaps mean that it's the action of working artfully to bring about complete disorder and confusion? Well, that might be what you first take away from the phrase. And indeed, if you've heard about the now legendary chaos monkey, the tool from Netflix, which is uh, known for taking out random services and uh, machines, you might think that that's what it is, that it's all about just causing chaos and, and seeing what happens. And to be fair, it really isn't. That's really more sort of cowboy engineering, where we're just taking pot shots at our servers to see you know what breaks let's say we take out a network cable and see if a database can still handle itself properly or if our uh, application layer can communicate uh, at the fact that the database has gone to the, the front end clients you know retry transactions and so on well that is a way of finding out if things are working the way you think or um, are going to break in ways that you didn't expect but it's not particularly disciplined. And that really is the big thing about engineering. It is a discipline. And chaos engineering is the discipline of experimenting on a system in order to build confidence in the system's capability to withstand turbulent conditions in production. Now, in some ways, perhaps the phrase chaos engineering is entirely misleading because I think the most important word in that definition other than discipline is experimenting and that suggests the scientific method that we are going to approach the problem of injecting faults in this case in a very controlled and precise manner so first we learn what the steady state of our system is we understand what normal looks like we then make a hypothesis that uh, perhaps if we are to remove the network cable from the database server, that our application will respond with errors in a timely manner. So they won't just sit there um, waiting for, say, the, the default eight hour timeout on some of the MySQL connection parameters. We'll design the experiment so that we can test that specific condition. And then we'll learn from the results and perhaps make fixes because maybe it doesn't go the way we thought we were going to. So one of the key enablers of uh, a good chaos engineering process is observability. This is the knowing the steady state. If you have a observability platform already, um, something like Honeycomb IO, for example, or you've got very good metrics capturing and monitoring in CloudWatch, you might well be in a very good state. But for a lot of us, we have to start at the, the beginning, start collecting these metrics and start to learn what normal looks like. Does normal look the same on a Monday versus a Wednesday? Or does normal change depending on the season of the year, the time of the year, if there's particular festivities, for example? Now, it's all good and well capturing all of these sort of metrics, but it's easy to get kind of lost in the woods, capturing everything that you, you can, like disk size, disk IO, um, network IO, everything you could possibly think of. But there's actually some very important metrics that uh, affect your users the most. These are the customer facing issues, uh, sorry, not issues, the customer facing metrics. These are things that if these numbers change, you know you are impacting your customers. And that is really one metric that you really need to get to as quick as possible. I'll give you some examples from um, places I have worked previously. For example, when I worked at uh, the DPD uh, parcel carrier company, one of the key metrics we monitored was how long it took to create a shipment and a label for 
in order, you know, in order for somebody to come and collect your parcel and ultimately deliver it for you. Now, if we were to deploy a new version of the, the web front end and that number changed, so it went from say 2.2 seconds, completely automated, go through the six steps that was in place uh, back then, and that number changed to say 2.4, that release would be rolled back because that was an unacceptable change. It was user impacting. Different company altogether, a company called Rant and Rave, they collected feedback on uh, from your customers, customers. So um, what we would do here is we would look to see how quickly received feedback was processed. So you're a customer, uh, let's say you're DPD and you've delivered a parcel and you've then asked the receiver of the parcel if that was a good experience for them and they give feedback. Well, from the moment that feedback is captured, you want it to be processed as quickly as possible. So there is um, potentially some translation, there's some sentiment analysis, and ultimately it lands on a dashboard so that uh, the users at DPD can understand how their customers are feeling right now in the moment and perhaps take action to get in touch with a customer who's unhappy and say, hey, sorry, we got it wrong, we'll do better. At Synologic, where I am now, we are uh, we have a platform that does investigations, uh, perhaps looking for fraud, um, looking for money laundering, th these sorts of things. And so one of the metrics we would look at is how long it takes for an investigation to begin, begin and land in a workbench so that our user can start uncovering the information in the particular investigation that they're doing. Some data sources take longer than others. Some searches are more complicated than others. But ideally, you put in all your search criteria, you start the investigation, you want the workbench to appear and the user to be able to interact with that investigation as soon as possible. So with all of that in the background, the kind of idea of what chaos engineering is, this discipline of experimenting in your production environment to see what happens when you introduce unknown circumstances, we will make use of the new AWS Fault Injection Simulator. So. Perhaps you've been using Chaos Monkey or you've written scripts to do similar. We now have a managed service and it has the ability to go in and behind some of the AWS services that would be very difficult for you to trigger faults in um, and you know, experiment and see what happens. Now, the fault injection simulator consists of experiments. And what you do is you create an experiment template, which we will go through in a moment. We run the experiment, ultimately the experiment will stop, and then we look at the results. Draw our conclusions, rinse, repeat. The nice thing about experiment templates is that we can reuse it. So we can potentially run these periodically and make sure that our systems continue to behave so that a particular experiment that maybe fails initially, then we see continues to work. And down the line, we know if that experiment fails, we've changed something in a negative way. So let's walk through what an experiment template is. Well, firstly, it consists of a number of actions that you're going to take. Some of them are things like waiting for a period of time. So we might perform an action such as terminating an EC2 instance, and then wait for five minutes and see what happens. Does any of the metrics change in an adverse way? Does it take longer for that shipment label to create? Longer to get the feedback in? Or does it now take an impossibly long time for a workbench to appear? Now, a lot of those actions depend on the targets that you select for your experiment. So at the moment, there's only a handful of targets available, but we can expect that like most AWS services that are new, there's a handful of use cases that they've targeted specifically. And if we ask AWS very nicely, they will expand that to cover more services over time. So naturally EC2 instances is right at the top of the pile. Here you can do things such as reboot them, stop them or terminate them altogether. Now, why would you want to terminate an instance? Well, if you've got it in a scaling group, 
you might want to be checking that when a new instance comes up and you maybe have some persistence volume, persistent volume that needs to be reattached, um, you want to make sure that that behaves the way you expect it to, or that the, the absence of a one node in your scaling group with you know, multiple nodes, that things like latency that the end users are experiencing doesn't change dramatically. The Elastic Container Service is also supported, although the only action you can take right now is to drain, uh, and you, but you can specify a percentage. So for example, you could run an experiment where you reduce the nodes by 5%. You could run another experiment and reduce the nodes by 25% and see what difference that might make to uh, your end user. EKS is also supported. Similarly, it's terminating node groups. And again, you can specify this by percentage. RDS is available at the moment here as well. And this is one of those things that with Chaos Monkey and other similar tools, it would be very difficult to do this. Rebooting, that's not too hard, but triggering a failover. That's an action that's available through the fault injection simulator that you just wouldn't be able to do uh, unless you sort of get right into the SDK and program that in yourself. And finally, this is a bit of an odd one. You think initially, I am. What would you do with I am? This is another one where you would not be able to do this, even with the SDK. This allows you to introduce things like API errors, um, such as an internal server error uh, hitting a throttling, or that a particular service is unavailable. At the moment, it's only on the EC2 API, but if you've ever looked at that, you'll know that there is a lot of API actions uh, in there. So there is no doubt a lot of really interesting things that you could experiment with by introducing these API errors into your environment. And so for example, what you might do is initially you have 5%, again, you can specify percentage here, 5% of EC2 um, create instances are failing. And maybe after 20 minutes, you ramp that up to the 20%. Um, and what you might be simulating here is a um, lack of capacity for a particular instance type that you are, are running. So once you've specified your targets, there is this optional piece, but by the end of this, hopefully you'll, you'll uh, agree with me that really it isn't optional. You should always specify these. And it is stop conditions. So these are CloudWatch alarms that if triggered, stop the experiment right there, right then, and does corresponding rollback actions where appropriate. So for example, if you stop an instance, an EC2 instance, and this triggers one of your CloudWatch alarms that you have nominated as a stop condition, this will cause the instance to start back up and presumably your alarm will clear shortly thereafter. Now, the reason I stress that these things are you know, very important is Chernobyl was an experiment gone so horribly wrong. Now, not to sort of belittle the disaster that is Chernobyl, and indeed I suspect that most businesses uh, using AWS are not in the business of running nuclear reactors, but there are scenarios that you could create which could be business ending for you. So for example, you might create a scenario that disables some key service that makes your platform entirely unavailable for your users. If you were to do this in the middle of your peak season and cause you know, users to go on to Twitter and other social media and rant about your platform, um, this may do huge reputational damage. There's the lost earnings as well uh, of all the sales that couldn't go through because you've triggered a failure scenario that you, you, you could have potentially um, prevented. So do think about what the stop conditions are. And by default, I would say those customer facing metrics we talked about earlier are the ones you should put in. At, at the very least, define those as stop conditions. And if those change in some way, that is you know, experiment over, get back to normal, 
go away, learn, and, you know, try again. Finally, there's a few kind of things that you get with every AWS service, and that is the ability to specify the IAM rule that's used for running the experiment, and you can also specify tags on the experiment as well, so that every experiment run from a particular experiment template will have the same tags, which will allow you to, uh, you know, filter uh, on those when you start having you know, a collection of historic experiments. So once you've defined your experiment template, off you go, you run your experiment and you monitor. While that's running, you keep an eye on things. You've got your stop conditions. You've definitely got your stop conditions. You wait for that and you hopefully get to the end of the experiment having not triggered any stop conditions. And you have either proven your hypothesis that your system can withstand these particular types of failures or you haven't proved it and you've now got some learnings to do to work out um, how to you know, solve a particular problem. So let's walk through an example of something we could learn by using the fault uh, injection simulator. So we've got a Kafka cluster. We've got five nodes. I've simplified things here. I'm not showing scaling groups. I'm not showing Zookeeper nodes. You, you know, Zookeeper should be running on separate nodes compared to the, the Kafka nodes. But for the purposes of this, we've got five Kafka nodes, two in two availability zones, one in one availability zone. And the key thing we're doing here is we've set our replication factor to three. Now, for those of you who aren't familiar with Kafka, what this means is that for every partition of data you have, there will be three copies across the nodes. What this means is that you should be able to lose two nodes and still be able to service traffic, uh, then you know, service new writes and reads. So what are we going to do? We're going to stop some instances. That's our action here. We're going to stop some instances to prove our, our hypothesis that we can, with, uh, we can withstand losing two nodes. So we'll specify our targets. So here's a, a JSON document saying that we are going to pick our resource type of EC2 instances. We're going to take advantage of tags. And I've said that there's a, a tag of type and the value of Kafka. And we're going to filter to the availability zone. So we're only going to select EC2 instances tagged Kafka running in EU West 2C. Stop conditions. The active controller count. This should, across all your nodes, sum to a total of one. If that is not the case, uh, say you've got an active controller count of two, we've actually introduced a split brain scenario where we've got effectively two separate clusters have formed um, from terminating two instances. The offline partitions count. Here, what's happened is that there are partitions that there's not enough copies in order to be able to uh, write or um, potentially read. And a similar metric that shows the same problem is the under-replicated partitions. So if that number goes up and stays up for a sustained period, then we know that we've, we've got a replication problem and that our hypothesis has been proven false, that we could withstand two node failure. So we run our experiment. Our availability zone, all of the Kafka instances are terminated and we wait. We might define the experiment to say run for 10 minutes. Maybe we leave it for half an hour. You know, choice is yours. But after a few moments, this alarm triggers. Offline partitions count. So we have partitions that have gone offline because two nodes are unavailable. And even though we still got three left, something in our configuration is not right. We have not proven the hypothesis. It's failed. We have not been able to withstand the loss of two Kafka nodes. So we go and we look and we try and understand what's happened. And it turns out we haven't specified the broker rack um, configuration parameter. So this is a, a configuration parameter where you can set 
uh, for example, use, use, you can define it to any value you want, but the idea is that you're saying these nodes are in the same rack. And so the likelihood is that in most failure scenarios, all these nodes are going to be unavailable together. And so if we kind of extrapolate that and say that availability zones are racks, then um, we can have two nodes here that are in the two, uh, 2A availability zone, one that's in 2B, and then the other that's in 2C. We've got the same experiment template as before. We're not changing any of our stop conditions. Our hypothesis is still that we can withstand the failure of two nodes. So we've you know, added this broker.rack configuration parameter. We've restarted Kafka. We're back up and running. We're in the normal state. And we run the experiment again. So again, two nodes in the availability zone 2C get terminated. And here we are. We leave it. We run. Let's say it's the 10-minute timeout. And at 10 minutes, we pass. We have successfully proven that we can withstand that type of failure. Two nodes going down, we can still service traffic. Now, what we might see is that some of those customer facing metrics change in ways that is, is unacceptable. So we would then have to decide, is that okay? Do we actually need to have even more Kafka nodes to withstand an availability zone failure? We can start to explore if we do lose an availability zone, do we bring up more nodes um, in these other two availability zones and explore what happens? You know, let's say there's for some reason a sustained outage, multi day outage of uh, an availability zone. What would our um, disaster plan be for that? Would we do a region failover maybe? Um, or would we have multiple scaling groups? running different um, sort of clusters together so that we can withstand some more failures. So hopefully you can see that there's quite a lot of things that you can do. And, and you know, as you start to kind of dig into this and learn about your platform, you can really go to town on um, the kind of failures that you can simulate, even though at the moment there's only a handful of service and a handful of actions. So some closing suggestions for you um, start small don't go you know for broke in production uh, terminating entire availability zones start by terminating a single instance in fact if you're running uh, as sort of best practices would suggest you do a non-production environment and a production environment start experimenting in non-production and learn about your system there. It may be you have some horrible resilience problems that you've just never come across because you've never had uh, the problem of losing an availability zone. So learn about some of these things quickly in non-production before you start doing things in production. Um, and so as your confidence grows, both in using the fault injection simulator, but also in your platform as a whole, start moving into into production because the workload in production will be different than non-production um I, you know, i've never seen a non-production workload that looks anything like production the, the the level of users the the data volumes are always very very different so you want to see and make sure that things um do still behave given these failure scenarios with the difference that production traffic brings and of course always use stop conditions. I can't stress that enough. Make sure you've got an escape clause for your experiment should something go horribly wrong that you just didn't see coming. So shameless plug, and I'm aware that we're an AWS community, and this is about GCP, but I have authored a live project with Manning, which is all about learning serverless data handling in GCP. Um, with the live project, you get access to those six uh, Manning books, um, and you work through a series of exercises um, in order to kind of layer up um, your knowledge of GCP services. So please do check that out if you're interested in serverless data handling. Um, a lot of the techniques that you can do in GCP, you can do in AWS, but as this does happen to target GCP. So with that, 
thank you very much for listening to my talk. I hope you found it useful and I hope you've learned something. Please reach out to me on, on Twitter and LinkedIn. And I look forward to, to seeing you around.